Okay, you're under attack. Dr. Head says it's time to get started, so let's do it. Uh, we welcome you to the campus of the College of the Ozarks, uh, albeit torn up as it is. Uh, you can find your way around campus if you get lucky and follow the signs, but we think we're making a lot of improvements and you'll probably agree with us next year if you're here. Oh, we're especially pleased to be a part of a or to sponsor a, a, a summit like this. And uh, as you notice on, on, the, on the screen up here, uh, a picture of the person for whom the summit is named here. Uh, Mr. Kathy and I had a friendship that went back almost 40 years. And uh, the, the, the late Truett Kathy it is now, unfortunately, but if you'll notice the tie that he's got on, uh, that's a good picture of him other than he's got the wrong tie on because the last time he was here, I wore my, one of my many Chick-fil-A ties that he had given me over the years. So we went upstairs and he put on a hard work U tie. And I thought, you know, this is a guy, <laughs> he knows how to do business. Uh, Truett Cathy uh, had a lot of interest that the College of the Ozarks has. And uh, he uh, was especially interested in uh, young people coming from the background that I came from, and maybe many of you did. And I first bumped into him uh, in Georgia. Uh, I'm from Georgia. Truett was interested in uh, giving kids a chance to go to camp that didn't have the money, basically. And so years ago, uh, when Berry College, which, which was similar to the College of the Ozarks, uh, closed what at that time was the Mount Berry School for Boys, which was basically like an orphanage. And uh, it was a work school. It was, pretty much a clone of the School of the Ozarks. And uh, I graduated there and uh, they decided to close it, which I've always believed was a mistake. Uh, there are more kids now that need to be helped from bad family situations like I had than when I came along. So why close something like that? Why not expand it? You know, well, they didn't ask me or it'd be expanded today. Uh, Truett leased all of that campus out there and he started building uh, foster homes. He took in foster kids himself. And uh, I ran into him because he had a program of send a kid to camp basically, but the camp was in North Carolina. That was before Camp Windshape opened. And uh, our son, we sent him to camp. And he at one time called and said, I need to meet the chicken man. And uh, I told him I thought the chicken man was dead. I thought he was talking about Colonel Sanders. <laughs> he said, no, nah, uh, Mr. Kathy. Well, I didn't know him, Mr. Kathy. You know, I said, oh, OK. So I went down there. And it, as it turns out, Truett had spent the night in his cabin. Now, believe me, in starting what is now Chick-fil-A Corporation, he, he didn't have a whole lot of spare time on his hands, but he had time to go up there and bring foster kids and spend the night in a cabin in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina. That impressed me. It got my attention. And uh, the foster kid that he had placed in Jeff's cabin uh, uh, became a kind of a friend of the family. Truett was trying to help him. Uh, like he did a lot of them. And so he invited us to this kid's graduation in Georgia. And I went down there and he said, well, you can stay at our home. And so I did. We spent the night with him. And his wife took us to this funny little restaurant called the Dwarf House. Do you know about the Dwarf House? Well, that's where Chick-fil-A started. And uh, the the chicken was good. Chick-fil-A is the only chicken worth eating anyway, but that's where my experience started with Chick-fil-A. There were no standalone Chick-fil-A's then. They were only in malls. 
just a few of those and we'll look at it today. But anyway, um, Truett decided to build his own camp, I guess you'd call it, Camp Windshape, and then they had a program to help kids go to college. Uh, Truett really identified with the College of the Ozarks. He came here many times. And uh, he visited us when we were in Kentucky before we moved here at another work school. So we had very, very similar interests. And we were trying to spend our lives helping certain kinds of people. And so uh, the Poverty Summit, dealing with trying to solve real problems that we have in our culture, it certainly fits some of his interests as I knew him. And uh, he was especially interested in younger children. That the uh, School of the Ozarks, the grade school, is named for him. And I remember going down to see him right before he died. And I, I'm, I'd managed to get in to see him. Most others could not. And he was sitting at his little table in his kitchen, and and uh, I thought, you know. This guy's had a profound impact on a lot of us. And so I told him that we were starting a grade school and I was going to see to it that it was named for him. He never asked me to do anything. And uh, that he had been a, a good leader. And, and because of him, a lot of people like me and lots of others had been given things they wouldn't have had otherwise. And how meaningful I thought that was. And so he just kind of smiled. He, Truett, Kathy was a person, uh, you didn't have to ask him for a whole lot. I, I'm not sure that I ever asked him for anything. Uh, he, he was a generous giver, but he just did it. You know, I didn't. I didn't have to lobby him at all. He saw something he was interested in. And so uh, that's kind of a little bit of his background. If you look at what's here today, uh, Camp Lookout, which we operate, this college operates, was my answer to Camp Windshape, which was his answer to Camp Ridgecrest. So it's kind of like a ripple effect, you know? And uh, I've often thought that if more uh, people that that had been as successful as Truett Cathy was, if they did with their money what he did with a lot of his, then we, we, would, uh, we would make America better again. And I think that uh, uh, that kind of money is well spent, and it was my privilege to know Truett Cathy better than most people. Uh, one other little thing I'll tell you before I end and is that he did suggest to me one time that it, it, I was quizzing him about his camp that he was starting. Well, he hired the director, my friend off Camp Ridgecrest. I told him, well, you had to steal our director to bring him down here to do it. And, and uh, he said, well, why don't you come down here and see the camp? Well, I, I mean, I had gone to school there. I knew <laughs> not much I didn't know about it. But I went down there, and I worked in the kitchen at the camp for a week to see it from the inside. They didn't know who, who I was. I didn't want them to know. And uh, Truett always laughed about that. He thought, I think that was a good experience for a PhD to wash dishes, but I'd washed them before. It wasn't new to me. But Truett Cathy was just a, a good role model, and I'm glad his name is attached to this summit, and I think that what you're doing, what we're doing, is certainly consistent with what uh, he would have liked a lot of other people to do. So welcome to our campus, uh, Dr. Head and uh, Dr. Bolger. I know spent a lot of time putting together programs like this, and, and uh, we appreciate their leadership there. So at this time, Dr. Head, I believe you're next one up. Well, good morning. 
It is great to have you here. So excited about today and what we're going to learn. Um, I wanted to give a couple of special welcomes this morning. I, I think Elizabeth Hughes is in the house, but I'm not sure where she is back here. Um, I just want to acknowledge and welcome Elizabeth back because she was the passionate person whose determination served as a catalyst for getting the project started that resulted in the report that you're holding today. So I just wanted to welcome Elizabeth today. Um, welcome back to the area. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank Sarah Morrow and the Missouri Foundation for Health for the grant that was used for this first phase of the project. Change is going to take a long time, but the funding of the first phase has given us a great uh, the first phase has given us a great starting place. So thank you Missouri Foundation for Health and Sarah Morrow. <clears throat> Finally, I wanted to mention um, we have 196 College of the Ozark students with us today, which should give us all great hope. They represent the nursing uh, majors, education, family studies, and then Dr. Bolger also taught a big Q class, the big questions of our society. And the focus of this one has to do with poverty. So they've been reading, learning, studying, digging in and better understanding <clears throat> this topic. And I just wanted to welcome all of these students here today and say thank you and we're so glad that you're part of our future. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk a lot about collaboration, and this video you're about to see is about our local Chick-fil-A operator, Kevin Hutchison, who's here, who, and it's a recent example of how working together we can accomplish so much. So welcome to the Chick-fil-A packing party. Hey, I'm Kevin Hutchison, owner-operator at Chick-fil-A here in Branson. On January the 19th this year, we partnered with Feeding Children Everywhere and all the Chick-fil-A restaurants in Southwest Missouri, covering Springfield, Branson, and Joplin, to package over 81,000 meals that are currently being used in local food pantries right here in Southwest Missouri. So we can put those in our homeless packets. Our food pantries, we can put them in bags where people are staying in hotels, you know. So it just makes it really nice to give them another option as a meal. As a business owner in Branson, I know that uh, things can get pretty tough in January and February. Uh, our one thing every year is to keep our full-time employees working year-round, even when maybe that's not the logical thing to do, uh, when we know that tourism has, has such dramatic swings throughout the year. But we know that if we can continue providing for families throughout the year, uh, that, that maybe they don't end up in the cycle. When you get a gift like uh, Chick-fil-A brought us with a supply of jambalaya. It's a big part of what we can do to help offset the needs of people who are facing food insecurity. We had a great uh, time just fellowshipping through that event but it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to see the, um, the efforts that were put forth from not only uh, the partnership with the College of Ozarks, but every Chick-fil-A restaurant and a lot of those organizations in the area. Well, that was a crazy fun. <laughs> that was a crazy day, but it was fun fun to work together. So, in pre in preparing for this day, I've been reflecting a lot on some of the spiritual giants in the history of this region. I think of Harold Bell Wright, who came to the Ozarks and wrote Shepherd of the Hills, a beautiful story of forgiveness and redemption. Reverend James Forsyth, who was determined to start a school called School of the Ozarks in 1906 to help young people who didn't have the means to obtain a Christian education. I think of Guy Howard, the walking preacher of the Ozarks, who roamed these hills sharing the hope of the gospel. And now you know a little bit more about a spiritual giant named Truett Cathy. 
each just one person who wanted to make a difference. I was also reflecting on examples of major projects that have impacted our area over the years. I thought of Table Rock Dam. I don't know how they did that, but wow, what a huge project that took so much work. Example years ago shared with me was the Hollister Industrial Park and how giving a place to give businesses um, a place to land was a great idea. And Ozark Mountain Christmas even, the extension of our season, was a big group effort. These were all created because passionate people saw a need and collaborated to make things happen. Last year, you may remember Ron Hall shared a story about his friend Denver. And Denver was a homeless African-American man who turned out to be a spiritual giant himself. He said, Mr. Ron, I see a whole lot of Bible studying, but not a lot of Bible doing. Harold Bell Wright, Reverend Forsyth, Guy Howard, and Truett Cathy, they were all about the business of Bible doing. Today you're going to learn about a new framework one that's helped some other communities move the needle on poverty. Today you'll learn about how a group of people in our community came together to research, listen, and learn about poverty in our region. We, um, the members of the steering committee of this group have visited various communities around the country, and today you're going to hear a little bit more about Greenville, South Carolina, where community members and organizations are collaborating at a high degree to find systemic solutions to their systemic problems. So let me tell you a little bit about who's gonna to talk to you today. Susan McLarty is the first coordinator of the Greenville Homeless Alliance. Prior to this, she served as the affordable on the Affordable Housing Steering Committee for the city of Greenville. The Greenville Homeless Alliance Steering Committee is chair of advocacy. United Ministries Executive Board is chair of congregational relations and Greenville Area Interfaith Hospitality Network Board. She is a graduate of Diversity Leaders Initiative with the Riley Institute at Furman University and an elder with the Presbyterian Church USA. She is currently serving as the vice chair of the Greenville Housing Authority Board. Susan is married to George and they have a daughter who I think is on a college search these days. In 2003, she accepted a call to ministry at Westminster Presbyterian Church in mission outreach and congregational care, where she was instrumental in developing new missions and programs to engage 1,800 adults and 800 children within and outside the church. She has been active in the community since moving to South Carolina to work for Millican and Company as an automotive, automotive textile designer in 1992. A graduate of North Carolina State University, she primarily grew up in Kingsport, Tennessee. Here's a quick video to show you a little bit more about Greenville, South Carolina. With inviting outdoor spaces and a revitalized urban center, Greenville County, South Carolina is experiencing a tremendous boom in both business and population. But there is another side to the story, including growing income disparity and displacement of long-term residents. To address these challenges, public and private partners are embracing a broad vision for an inclusive culture of health working together to ensure that every resident will be able to enjoy all that the county has to offer. It's a very vibrant community. Our role is to make sure that it's equitable and that it's accessible for all people. So you're seeing a lot more activism and people reaching out to their neighbors. That's a powerful and necessary thing. Housing is critically important to the dignity of a community. We purchased 25 lots to include the property where the church sits that will be housing that's affordable for working class people in a community where that's not always the case. <laughs> Unity Park is right in the middle of the black community. And so when you have a multi-million dollar development, how do we make the growth and the accessibility equitable? I told city council, oh, this is your dollar. We do not want Greenville to be a gated community. We ask that they would donate some of the property around the park for affordable houses 
So we're moving toward bringing people back to the neighborhood. One of our biggest problems is transportation. Finally, we have had community leaders, business leaders, governmental leaders come together and say, we got to do something better. Good mass transit is critical to the growth of our area. Now Greenlink has made a whole lot of changes, which will let more people have access to health and opportunity. The Swamp Rabbit Trail was a collaboration of our county and city working together to create a trailway for walking and biking. It has just transformed communities. We have over 20,000 job vacancies. Our chamber saw that there was a great pool of people who needed to work. There were barriers to them getting employment. One of those barriers was criminal records. And so we decided to go forth and push the Workforce Expansion Act, where people with felony drug convictions are able to get their record expunged where they can get into the workforce, and it's working. On Track Greenville is a partnership of community organizations that put students at the center. During the pilot, we saw an improvement of our chronic absent students, and we saw academics improve. I believe it's due to a lot of the pieces that we've implemented. The greatest strength of Greenville is its willingness to look at itself and to say, we believe we can change. So please join me in welcoming Susan McLarty from Greenville, South Carolina. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be with you all today and I want to just begin with a few thank yous. First, thank you to Sue and Pamela here at the Keter Center and for that awesome welcome this morning from uh, Dr. Jerry Davis. And to the entire staff, uh, it is so impressive, the students and the, the atmosphere here. This is my first trip to Branson. And I just quickly wanted to share, sometimes when we open our stories, we see how they're connected. And so we were so excited to see that you all had read and brought in Ron Hall, because that's in our story too. Denver met a woman in Charlotte, North Carolina, who then we went to study how she heard this one whisper of God speaking into her life, and she went on to build a very specific type of housing. And what Denver said to her was, you do all this good, and then you lock them out to the bad at night. And that one statement from Denver changed the projection of this one person's life. So I just wanted to quickly share that and then to say, this is a beautiful campus, a beautiful area. And two things stand out to me that I, I want you to hold on to today as we talk. It sends signals to people who visit, like myself, and to those who come for your tourism economy, when they see these signals, the first is it's very orderly. Like I loved everything in my room here had a, a purpose and a reason to make me not have to wonder for a split second what to do next. Like it said, your hair dryer is located here. You know, so like everything in the room, just hospitality to an incredible amount of detail that's very orderly and sends a signal that this is a safe environment and, and that you value those who are visiting. The second is there's just so much pride. And from the moment I talked to Sue about coming here, there was pride around the Keter Center and, and I was just so excited to join you all and to be here today. So pride in your community, I think you need to look at what are you doing here specifically as well at the Keter Center that might be some clues to the opening up of your entire community. So I thank the entire team who planned this summit and just mention the slides today are intentional to help you think about as you leave this summit. Uh, I chose this because to me they represent puzzle pieces and I believe you all have a ro the right pieces in place you just need to reorient those pieces in a new way. So we're gonna spend about the next 
40 or so minutes on the subject of collective impact. And I'm gonna share how the Greenville Homeless Alliance used this format to create a framework for us, why we chose this model, and then give you a few examples of how that's working and how we've achieved more by working together. So I'm so glad we got to see the video. Uh, we just won this award in Greenville back at the end of 2019, and so we had a, a lot of filming and, and work that took place, and that's some of our collateral, and I'm so excited we, we were able to share it with you today. What you don't know is that Greenville had applied for this award from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation a couple of times before we won it, and so that is a lesson, too. By pushing yourself forward into this collaboration, you might go for things that you won't first achieve, but it'll teach you something in the process. So I want you to think as well, are you a learning community? Are you a learning community that's really committed to that act of ongoing learning? And I know you're gonna have a challenge today when you leave around that question. This award is important for Greenville, but it actually didn't come with much money tied to it. And sometimes money does solve problems, but sometimes money just works as a catalyst to help propel you forward. And so for Greenville, our next phase of work is really tied not to the money, but how we took what we learned and used those relationships and continue to propel the work forward. Because we're working to catalyze and sustain this positive change around advancing health, opportunity, and equity. And the common denominator of all these faces you see on, on, so these are some of us that were in Greenville and a few that traveled to accept the award. But the common denominator I want you to think about as we're here for the Poverty Summit today is the household income. So when you boil it all down, you know, that is sometimes the hardest obstacle. And I loved, uh, Jerry, your comments that it's harder today than any time in our nation's history to achieve what we call economic mobility. And if you looked at Greenville on a map, there's a map called the Opportunity Atlas. We're actually one of the hardest places in the entire United States to move upwardly. So what's my hope for you today? I wanna to ask first, um, and maybe this group, if you're a student, just hold your hand, because I don't think this will apply to you yet. Anyone in the room, please raise your hand if you have children. So a lot in the room raised your hand. Anyone currently raising a teenager around the age of 13? Okay, these are your experts in the room today. <laughs> When I thought about where you all are and where the Homeless Alliance is, I wanted to say it took us about five years to get to where we are today. So you're, you're 13, right, with your Poverty Summit? Where do you want to be when this summit turns 18? I have a 17-year-old, like we just, she's about to be 18, March the 2nd. And what we say to her often is, we don't want you living here forever. So over here to the students, I don't think you have to worry about these students. Um, I was trying to get Courtney to come look at Greenville and she disappointed me last night when she said she wants to stay in Branson. Darn. Uh, but you really wanna think about that it does take time to do this work and where are you gonna be when you turn 18? And, and that's my hope for you today is that you're gonna move uh, from these teenage years, which sometimes we call, you kinda can go to the dark side. Does anybody have a teenager? You ever heard that saying? Luckily, we haven't experienced that at my house. We just have one daughter, but you really want to keep that communication open, and that is so important in this work, and be transparent and honest and, and realistic. And I think if you can do that, you can go lean into the light. My story quickly is that my church, before I got into this work, had a capital campaign, and it was called A Place for Everyone. And we had some money left over from that campaign because in, in making that argument to our faith community, we actually had more gifts come forward than, than what we needed. So we were sitting on some dollars, 
And I went to my boss, who was also my pastor at that time, and I said, you know, our community now really needs um, to think about how we're going to be a place for everyone because we're seeing this growing divide. So I think we could do a tithe from a property that our church had just recently acquired when I was making this case, and that would have been about a 10% tithe of a property our church had bought in order to hold land for future expansion. would have been about $50,000. And he said to me, I think we can do more. And that tithe that I thought, just 10%, he said, I think we can turn that into 100000 And he went to the elders of our church, and they were able to vote on that. And I was so proud that to say that our church was the first to put money into this new way of working around housing. So I say that to encourage you to think about here Do you see yourself as a child of God? And if you do, do you believe that we are all created in God's image? And if you believe that, then I think what you're after is absolutely possible. So I want you to be encouraged. I want you to lead and serve with open hands as followers of Christ. And it's really refreshing to be here with you today because... I don't always get to talk this way now in my role, so it's really nice to be back and be able to be in a culture where that is more the way that I see the Branson way. So just lean into this light of God's abundance. And I do a lot of mountain biking with my husband, and and I have a motto that once we found this shared vision around the Homeless Alliance, we just say, point it straight and ride it light. And then in Branson, I'd say, Trust in God. You'll get there. So I hope, finally, that you will leave with action. And when you do lean into that collaboration and not competition, that you're going to find, just as we have in Greenville, that God is going to do more than you could ever imagine. And when you serve from this posture of abundance, and not scarcity, you're going to find that it's refreshing, it is filled with joy, and it's filled with God's peace, which can surpass all of our understanding. So just think about that. We want to reframe our perspective when we, um, and I want to mention, I really like your book that we're going to talk later about, but I will say there's an important component, I believe, around this word action that Leadership is a word, and I was taught by a mentor, that we don't identify leaders. We identify the word leadership, and that's an active role of exercising and working. And so leadership should, should move you towards action, and sometimes that can mean that you step into a space where no one else is doing something, and that's an active role of leading and working. So I'll I'll try to never use the word leader because I was taught that by a mentor. And I just throw that out there today for you to think about as you move towards action. Um, This picture is from Greenville and is is our bridge that really transformed our downtown. And And I like this picture because this is a day where we'd had a lot of rain and the river was just raging. And so a lot of people came out. So part of what this collaboration is, you're trying to create... Um, and focus on what is your resource here in Branson. For us, this was a a hidden resource in Greenville for many, many years that our mayor worked tirelessly to get a bridge removed. So there was actually a, a, a highway that went over this and hid the bridge from anyone knowing there was a waterfall under it. And finally, after many, many years, he was able to convince a lot of partners to remove a bridge. So there may be something in Branson that's hidden today, it could be people, or it could be something else, but that's for you all to determine. But in Greenville, once they removed this bridge, it has transformed our economy. And so people are just all over that part of downtown now where they didn't used to come, and, and that's the big story around Greenville's transformation. So I like to continue to think about what is that hidden resource and then use 
that focusing that attention on that becomes a currency. So attention equals currency. And attention can also be the currency of leadership. So getting people to pay attention to the tough issues rather than the diversions is at the heart of this strategy. So you want to maximize this impact. Pastors, uh, do we have pastors? I think we have some pastors in the room today. I see some hands. Anyone else on the church staff? So I've been there and, and been in the trenches with you, and I know that's a really fine balance. And so you have to think, too, as you move into this phase of action, that it takes a lot of hands and a lot of people working together that creates a much lighter load. But, you know, there's always that fine balance if you're in the church or really in any organization of how much staff do we need versus, you know, how many um, people do we need around this. And again, in Greenville, what we've seen sometimes just finding that language, for us it's been a tithe. Recently, I'll, I'll talk about how that helped us use attention to create currency of actual money. And then just wanted to help you all see again from thinking of yourself as these teenagers with your poverty summit. For Greenville, it really started back in 2015 and we were able to put a stake in the ground and say with some leadership in our community, a very trusted, uh, it, would, it would honestly be, Dr. Davis, if, if like you said, something's gonna have to change today and if we don't you know, all rally around that, then, then we are gonna not see the progress and we're only gonna see maybe things get worse. And so for us, it was what was called Tent City. You can go on our website and read this paper if you're interested and it just outlined what were the key issues around homelessness at that time, as well as what were some major weaknesses in our system in Greenville, and then a series of recommendations to close these gaps. And my position was the first in that that was achieved, and it took, I was hired in 2018. So just to give you an idea of staking the ground, three years later, it came together to hire my position. I think you all are in a a different phase than we were in Greenville, but that might just help from perspective. So collaboration can become this X factor. And in a, in a room like this and in the conversations I've heard since I've been here, I think you all have all these pieces, like I mentioned, in place. But you maybe you've got to reorient them now in a new way. And you have to really want it bad. I told, I've told the group, I've told all three groups when we've had these working meetings, and I say it to you as well, you have to want it bad because it's difficult work, but if you all want it bad and you all keep that shared vision, you will be amazed at what you accomplish. So you, in wanting it bad, sometimes that means you have to be willing to let go of some old ideas. But when you do, you're gonna create this vacuum of space that you can step into with leadership and then you decide what goes into that space. And, and I see that you all really are moving in that direction. So the secret sauce, why is this the X factor? So the X factor in durable, durable is a really important word, so hold on to that. Durable systems change is not always the volume of money, but the existence of a partnership and in mobilizing those resources. So the best way to get started is to start by building on your strengths. And I can tell you from just being here less than 48 hours, you all have tremendous strengths and assets in this community. So you wanna start by building on those strengths and recognize again that work is involved. But what a great example that we're here at the Keter Center and this is what y'all are all about, right? <laughs> so the work of mobilizing partnerships has this intrinsic value of, of its own and actual fewer dollars for more genuine multi-institutional contributions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the slides coming, are always preferred to more dollars from less robust partnerships. So everybody get that? Fewer dollars from genuine 
multi-institutional contributions are always preferred. In Greenville, this is how it started for us, and philanthropy played a very important role. So in our city, we have a severe housing deficit, and back in 2016, when I was talking about our church doing that $100,000 gift, it came at a time that our city was deciding to finally take some dollars out of our own coffers. Because I guess, raise your hand, does anyone in Branson like to hear about taxes going up? Well, they don't like that in Greenville either, but we had this historic moment in our, because of this downtown revitalization, suddenly our city had a surplus of funds. So I don't know, I haven't looked at your city budget, but for Greenville, we suddenly had more tax dollars come in than we had budgeted for. And what philanthropy, when they saw that news emerge, they very quickly mobilized as partners in philanthropy and said to the city, we'll put a million dollars on the table if you'll match it. And the city said, we will double what you're offering philanthropy. And that became the historic, exciting news. Something is different, something is happening here. And we got people excited and we showed up at uh, the city council meeting and so many people came that y'all, my pastor got turned away. <laughs> He didn't get there early enough because the room overflowed and the fire marshal said, no more visitors, we're full, You're gonna, we're sorry, we didn't even expect this. They, they would have set up more spaces had they expected it in like overflow rooms. They didn't even expect that to happen. So that created this excitement. And that is really important around this policy systems and environmental change for your economic development for your long-term prosperity, and for this X factor of partnership. Because our challenge at that time was far more than $3 million. It was actually $250 million. But if we didn't get started, then that was only going to grow as well. So I gave some information to your affordable housing chair. And we're, we're seeing continued innovation occur in Greenville, and you have to really leverage those dollars around housing. It's, it's hard work. This is the common framework that we've adopted to form the Homeless Alliance. It starts with having a common agenda, a shared set of measurements, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and this backbone support. So for us, hiring my position was, was an important step in having that backbone formally have staff and begin to move into a new phase of work as we saw you know, that staff could focus waking up every day. Some people jokingly call me the housing czar, but uh, my title is intentional in that it's a coordinator. I'm not a CEO, I'm not a um, president, I'm a coordinator. And that's very intentional. This is an example of what collective impact and what, how we helped begin to tell the public our story and also to invite partners to join us in this work. And so when that white paper was published, there were 18 partners. So that was 2015. Today we have over 75 partners. Those are organizations. We have over 900 people joining us in this work. And so when you think about that, I just wanted to quickly share for us what that looked like. We were able to start my position in a very um, minimal budget because we had a backbone. We're the backbone, but we had a host organization, United Ministries, who said uh, there was a competitive application process and they were selected for that role. And I'm an employee of United Ministries but I report to my steering committee, so that's on your top left. And the steering committee works to set priorities, to coordinate the action, and to ensure that both the financial and the human capital resources are there to support the collective agenda. So the steering committee role is different than a board. We're not a 501c3, the Greenville Homeless Alliance. We're a coalition of voluntary partners but I, I'm able to be paid by United Ministries and 
The working groups are right under here, and that's where the real work starts to happen around this collective impact initiative. So these are targeted groups, and I think you all are going to have a panel up next that you've kind of got that somewhat already in place here. And then you're kind of in this continuous process of planning and doing, planning and doing. And you're grounded in this evidence-based feedback around what is working, what is not working. And we got to look at that, and we got to be transparent and keep that always in front of us in a way that's continuing to grow this um, public will and also our political will. So housing, in case you didn't know, is, can be really changed at the local level. So can transportation. And if you don't believe that, if you take nothing else away today, know that if you wait for someone else to solve those two problems for your community, they won't get solved. Everything has been pushed to the local level, and that's what we've had to figure out in Greenville. How do we then mobilize the community? How do we mobilize our local bodies of government to address those challenges? This is the steering committee now for the Homeless Alliance in our phase two. And just to give you an example of the partners we have around that table include our school district, our superintendent of schools, our city and our county are represented, as well as local business partners, and then, of course, our important service providers. We have the foundation, one of the foundation that invests in our work as well at the table, and that's an important role. So again, sometimes there has to be a loss when you step into the new space, and for us, when we first formed, we had mostly service providers forming the Greenville Homeless Alliance. So it felt a bit like a loss to some of our service providers when we went to this new formation. But we believe this is the way we get to that long-term, durable systems level change. And we see the, the fruits of that now in the way we're approaching the work. So this gives you an idea of some of the other partners at the, when I say there's 75, we have our health sector, our hospital systems represented, uh, our housing authority, but also our Phoenix Center that helps treat people with addictions, our Home Builders Association. If you think, you know, they don't need to be at the table, then you may find out later that they're going to be a force that opposes your efforts around housing. We have an example of Soteria that you saw in the video, and I wanted to give a shout out to my friend Jerry and just encourage you to look up Soteria and he's really helped Greenville see that there is talent in people returning from incarceration. And if you don't recognize that, there's also a cost to your community. And so he's built um, a nonprofit community development corporation that works to bring, to provide a transitional housing, workforce skills, financial uh, education, and transition people back into society. And the beauty of that is that for many of our jobs that are in the tourism sector, this has become a real shift for our employers to, to welcome those employees and to treat them just like anyone else. And you would not believe the retention by that very act alone. By welcoming someone and treating them just like you would any other person. Um, they are seeing very high levels of retention and, and they're coming into more entry-level jobs. So I'm going to quickly go through how can, uh, these are two examples coming up, how can this actually be applied on the ground and how can it sometimes one plus one can equal more than six? So this is called medical respite. I know we have some health providers in the room. And in Greenville, we identified we had a real gap that we, while we have emergency shelters, they couldn't care for people being released from the hospital with certain medical conditions. And so therefore people were released from our hospitals back to the street, and where did they bounce right back to? The hospital. So there's a major cost uh, for the hospital in that. And these are our medical respite beds now, and this is a pilot program. So the, the beds you see in the photo, the guy on the, the left is, runs our Miracle Hill rescue mission, uh, actually the Miracle Hill ministry, I'm sorry, the rescue mission is our men's shelter. 
Uh, the other guy on the right is the reporter that came to cover the story the day that these opened. But just to give you an idea, that's what the beds look like. This was a space that the rescue mission said, you know what, we could probably rearrange our space. We could make this available and they were, you know, kind of took some talking and convincing, but they, they figured that out, created this space, and then they partnered with a local health provider, New Horizon Family Health Services, who has supplied a nurse. And if y'all could meet Kendall, she's just like a, a light of, of joy and hope, and she's like, this is my happy place now. She gets to come and work with the men who've been released from the hospital and help them transition out of, um, you know, medical care. And we have other partners at the table, service providers who are helping bring other wraparound support services that are needed. And then we have referrals from our two major hospital systems. So how can that equal more than six is you just have to figure out sometimes what are the costs you're gonna incur versus the cost you're gonna save. So there, this is an expensive program, don't get me wrong. To have a nurse that's dedicated to six or less people on a daily basis for those in the room in the health sector is probably unheard of. But this is the cost per year to operate six beds that we base this, we're still gathering our own data because this is such a new pilot for us, but we looked at other models working across the country and said, the cost could be as little as 150,000 roughly a year for six beds versus you know, 2.6 million that you would incur without having this in your community. The next example I wanna share because I know you all have a lot of motels here and that's creating a housing difficulty is we had in Greenville, one of our motels, we have a similar problem, just not as many motels as you all have, but we had a similar situation in that one of our motels suddenly closed on the coldest night in January, and it was a life safety issue with our codes enforcement officers having to come in and immediately close a motel, which meant about 100 people were suddenly displaced, and majority of those were individuals who this was their long-term housing. And because it was the coldest night in January, we had no emergency shelter beds available either. And so it was a really low point for our community, but it created a, a, a way that we could mobilize and say, we're not really proud of this, and we would like to not see this happen again in our community. And so we started a series of conversations that resulted in a report you can see on our website that's called the Motel Displacement Response Plan. So this is an example of collaboration that can happen without any money, except we did have a little bit of money that helped house people temporarily that were displaced, but the plan itself, really no money involved in creating this plan. And what that gave us was a template of who are the partners in Greenville who were willing to, to make a commitment, should this ever happen again, that they would mobilize and show up to reduce human suffering. And so we have an immediate group that responds and involves law enforcement as well as city and county um, communication, like each government body has a communications person. So we immediately mobilize and then we have 80 different types of commitment in this report from 35 different partners that say, should this ever happen again, we're gonna show up and we're gonna do X. And some of those picked one thing and some picked three or four things, but you can look at the report. This slide here just gives you an idea of how, working with our Red Cross, we were able to look at what they do when a natural disaster occurs, and that helped us figure out, all right, who needs to show up from our service providers to meet people where they are when they're displaced, but we also need to be aware that our motels are full as well in Greenville now. Um, when this happened, our emergency shelters were full, so we gotta have another plan. Where are we gonna put people? And that's where our churches said, you know, I, I could do that, and, but you all just need to help me know what that, that looks like. But so we said, all right, here's what the Red Cross will provide. So you can see, they said, you know, we can do hygiene kits, blankets, cots, and our, we have Meals on Wheels in Greenville. They said, we can do meals. You know, we normally wouldn't do that, but we could do that in, in this case. And then these were some of the churches that have very large spaces that said, you know, we could open up our church, we could do that. And 
so that's what we learned. And we started to say to people, as, you know, of all types, from our elected officials to the general public, this is important because we have no room in the inn. We have no room in the inn, and these are people, many of who are working in our economy, and some who are very vulnerable because they have nowhere else to go. The other part that we put in the plan that might be helpful for you all to think about, we, all, we do have, as you saw in our video, we do have some public transportation. However, it stops running currently at about 7 p.m. at night. So when the people were displaced, if they didn't have a car, they also had no public, they had no transportation to go anywhere other than walking. And so we also said, you know, that's not acceptable. Many of our churches have vehicles that they own, and they said, you know what, we, we could show up with our church bus. Uh, Greenlink said, you know what, we have some special vehicles, that's our public transit. They said, you know what, we could show up too in the case of an emergency like this. We just need to know and be brought into this plan. And then some of our service providers said, oh, we have vehicles too. We're willing to show up and help with transportation. So that's an example of, of how Collaboration can't cost anything, but it really mobilizes you to see who's willing to do what in your community and identify other gaps and join people together around this shared vision. Um, when we presented this final plan to our local government, we went to both city council and, set, and to county council, and they both unanimously adopted a resolution of support as well in favor of the plan. And our county council chairman said, who had military uh, background in his work life, said, I think you ought to do a simulation. <laughs> so that was really a, a fun way, too, to help partners work together in a new way. So we did a simulation, and this picture is from our simulation. We had young people, it'd be like, if we wrote scripts and asked your students to show up and be the people who were displaced, they took these roles so seriously that they really, um, made our service providers work very hard, and our law enforcement, and our codes officers, and, and it just floored everybody that these young people took it so seriously and really got into the role of being the displaced person. So in, in Greenville, we also talk about this. You know, we're, we've got immediate needs. We also have long-term implications. So we say it's both a moral and an economic imperative. And for us, just being able to have my position and pull data around what's happening in our school system allowed us to look at a trend there that's a not pretty trend. So if, in Greenville, we've gone from as recently as the school year of 2011-2012 with 582 students whose families self-identified that they were experiencing homelessness to now over 1,106 children. So those are just the children whose families, again, self-identified. And we have a local education partner who produces a report, and in that report we say as a community that we know education drives economic prosperity. Would anyone in here disagree with that remark? Education is key to driving that economic prosperity. The failure to educate, I've heard you all talking about this, so you're aware of this, the failure to educate carries huge social cost. I see heads nodding. So what we started to say was, what does that look like if these 1,106 students don't graduate? And we've been able to say to our community, over a lifetime, that average dropout will cost our taxpayers more than $300,000 in lower tax revenues. That means higher cash and in-kind transfer costs, imposed incarceration costs, compared to just an average high school graduate. So if you can save one child out of that 1,106, have them stand up here as the president of this uh, college one day, you've saved $300,000. So there's just a new way and a different way to think about that. But in Greenville, that cost, if we don't address it, means over $330 million that we're losing out on as a community. So the reason you plan is to get the most out of what you got. And as we've been planning and doing, um, forming the Greenville Homeless Alliance has allowed us to have a way to look at our community and come up with a new number. 
And so now we're trying to help educate our community that we can say without a doubt over 3,600 people in the most recent 12 months experienced homelessness in Greenville, South Carolina. This new number also says that one third of those are children. And now we can say based on getting all those partners to the table, looking at their assets, what is it our service providers can do? What is it they can't do? And for children, that means we have 90% who have no access to resources to end their homelessness. 90%. And that gets people's attention and says, if we don't do something collectively as a community, we aren't going to change that. So this is a picture from we held when we released our report in November of 2019. We invited our, this is our mayor on the left and our county council chairman, I'm sorry, on the right, and our county council chairman on, on your left. To, and they brought a proclamation. So we, we've got a new stake in the ground that says this is our number now. And the proclamation was the first time we've had our city and our county jointly sign one. And, and they were just so happy to be there and be part of the conversation. It, it means we still have a lot of hard work ahead, but it was very important that they join us and make this jointly with the way our city county government needs to move forward together. And then this is our superintendent of schools on the right. When we got the word out about this press conference, the response was incredible. The room overflowed that our, some of our city council members couldn't find a seat or even room to stand. We had all three news stations show up. We had all of our local papers show up. So just by producing this report, bringing those tables to the partner, partners, in one day we reached 100,000 people, we estimated. And that's that power of this collective collaboration. And you need to be educating everyone in order to achieve that. So we're looking forward now to an, a new way to celebrate this, what we've declared as the Greenville Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Day in 20, uh, we'll do that in November of 2020. These are the four things we use to kind of say, who, who are we? What is it the Homeless Alliance can do together? We can advocate, we work to educate, we collaborate, and then we innovate. And those four elements right there, we believe are the key to what we can all join together to do and to get everyone pointing in that direction of your shared vision and your shared mission. So I've got, I think, two more slides. This is a story just to help you think about, um, it'd be like, if you took your, your letters here, this is a story from our Greenville rescue mission that helps men um, get over a lot of barriers and obstacles in our community. And in their gym, they had a letters over their stage that said, are you saved or lost? It's a valid question. Are you saved or are you lost? But they decided it was a bit too judgmental to say, are you saved or are you lost? So they took those same letters and they changed it. And their director said it was a God thing that they realized they could use those same letters and say, you are loved. You are loved. A very simple but welcoming and inclusive message. And this picture of the young man here comes from someone who came through our services in Greenville. His name is Justice. And Justice had a lot of obstacles and barriers in his life, a lot of trauma. Now he's working and he's in a tourism job that's a very essential job in our community. What if we didn't put those pieces back together for justice? And I think what you'll find is that with most people who experience poverty, who experience homelessness, is there is a trauma that has occurred in their life. And there's people like us who we really want to help 
overcome and help them solve that trauma and put those pieces back together and help them find a pathway out. So I wanted to use the example of the body of Christ because this is in your book, Rooting for Rivals. And it comes, it's one of my favorite examples from 1 Corinthians. You are Christ's body. This, uh, mes- this version comes from the message. You are Christ's body, that's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as ex- you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. It goes on to talk about what those different parts look like, who they are. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But now I want you to find a different way in partnership. And so I leave you with our uh, logo here in the top right for the Greenville Homeless Alliance is an intentional logo of showing that if we don't join arms together, we will not solve homelessness. It's got to be focused on people. So that's a person in the center. And we should always put the person in the center of our work. And that little orange dot is to represent hope. And sometimes we have to carry that hope for other people. But it's very important that we do that and then we give it back to them. So our vision is that our community will work to make homelessness brief and rare, ensuring that safe, affordable housing for everyone exists with access to everything they need to have a healthy and fulfilling life. The home here in this slide for you is intentionally placed at the center today. Without stable housing, I would say everything else will fall apart, just as it has in our community and as it will here in Branson. Housing is economic development. Housing is an important part of infrastructure. You as the community must mobilize to make that a priority. And again, you have all the pieces in place. So I thank you for your time, and I just really appreciate being here with you today, and I'm looking forward to some time now for questions. Hi, everybody. My name is David Moore. I've been had the pleasure of working with the team throughout this whole project, and I'm thrilled here today to help move things along a little bit. We're going to use your technology to help us ask questions. So you, get, you have permission to take those phones out. You still have to keep them silent. Um, but we're going to use a, a, a device tool to have you submit questions or comments or things you'd like to talk on. So let me do those instructions really quickly. You can open any web browser on your phone. And if you don't have this and you want to submit a question, find somebody under 30 near you who (laughs) has the phone. Sometimes that's me. Um, You go to this website, menti.com, and it will prompt you to put a phone number, uh, put a number in. And you enter these numbers, six numbers. And the next thing that's going to pop up is a prompt to say, do you have any questions for Susan? And as you put your questions in, they're going to show up on my computer screen, and I can ask those questions of the group. Make sense? I know I, I gave you permission to open your phones, which means you're looking at texts and emails <laughs> and Snapchat. So, um, but it's your chance to sort of submit some questions, and I'll pull from those to talk about things. First, I want to sort of see Su- Susan. So, do you have any questions for Susan? <laughs> to start us off, or I can go first if you don't. Wow, well thank you for um, sharing part of the Greenville story with us. It's really encouraging. And I guess um, a question I have is, could you tell a little bit, just in a snapshot, the story of the crisis that occurred in your community regarding Tent City? Sure. Yes, so in the white paper slide that I showed you, 2015, that was 
the result of a crisis that became known as Tent City. And it was a very peaceful encampment of people living under a bridge close to our downtown. And what happened was our local news realized that there was a very small encampment there, ran a series of stories in our newspaper that was called the Unseen Greenville. And so when those stories ran, people read it and they were, they were shocked that they didn't realize people lived under any bridges in Greenville. And because they knew of this location now, they started to bring items that they thought were helpful to the people living under the bridge. And then the word got out because there were multiple encampments even at that time in Greenville. And so the word got out and people came and the population very quickly swelled in a, the, the peaceful encampment suddenly became violent because of the actions of people like us. And so there's um, toxic charities. We, we try to talk about that a lot in Greenville. And when it became violent, it meant that our, the entire tent city had to be closed. But it became a point where we be, started working together in a new way. And that was that stake in the ground. So the white paper was the result of that. And, and our city and county service providers found that we needed to work together in a new way. So lots of great questions coming in. So I'm gonna pull some to get you responding to. Um, how did your community, well, first of all, real quick, size of Greenville was one of the first questions of detail, just context. How big is Greenville? Our oh. city is about 65,000, and then our county is around 500. Okay. And, and that's why for us it's very important that those two local government bodies work together. Great. So then, how did your community tackle the stigmas and negative connotations associated with impoverished individuals and communities? That's a great question. It takes a lot of education. I, I gave Sue a publication, and a, um, there's been a hashtag that helped our tourism industry. It's called, yeah, that Greenville. And, and so that has elevated our tourism industry significantly by having that single hashtag in the publication and that I brought Sue. But we've also done a series of classes around the other side of, yeah, that Greenville. And that's where we, we collectively open up this opportunity for those who are working in different fields of um, nonprofits addressing big challenges in your community, you know, educate churches, we started intentionally with the, that series of classes to work with churches and make sure everybody understands what those challenges are and how if we can't connect those collectively together, then you know if you're only working over here on mental health, you still may not solve that homelessness issue. And so that's been one way. We've also done a lot of tours on buses with our elected officials, with the general public, to show positive examples of housing that has been built. And so just getting people out in your community, showing them sometimes the positive examples, but also in Greenville, we, we still show we have a lot of very dilapidated housing stock that unfortunately is the only option for people to live in. So it's, it's a kind of a both and. What are some of the old ideas Greenville had to let go of to make progress on the work you're doing? I would say the biggest old idea is around how our city and county are going to have to work together. And I say that because now our, our downtown that was in the slides is very dependent on jobs that pay a wage around, we still have minimum wage in South Carolina, so anywhere from seven twenty-five up to $15 an hour, any jobs in that range of wages, our, our economy now depends on those, but we've also at the same time had this influx of very high paying jobs come to Greenville. And so what you see now within the city of Greenville is you need to be earning about 65,000 annually or up just to try to live somewhere in our city. And so to get people to the jobs, they, are, they have to live now in the county. And so how those two bodies work together, to, especially around transit, 
is very, very important. So that's been the biggest thing and why we've been so intentional with the Homeless Alliance. We don't just do something with the city. We're always bringing the county with us because again, for the county being 500,000 people, if we can't bring them along, um, the city's just stuck. So um, a, a lot of questions have come in about the role and possibilities of the college st students as advocates and partners in the work. Can you talk about sort of what sort of suggestions or recommendations you might have for the role of college students who want to sort of be part of creating change in the community and, and what you've seen happen? Yeah, a big thing we've done is help just create a platform for people to use their voice around decisions with our local government. And so young people are great at that, you know, getting that message out using social media, but using it in a way to bring people to a physical location. So, it, it, you know, you can do education as well on through social media, but what we've done is mobilize people to show up and sometimes that just means showing up sometimes it means wearing a particular color of a t-shirt or sometimes we've been giving out t-shirts which people like <laughs> and and then just telling people here's if you want to show up and give public comment which young people with your class on poverty and other things you've learned might be able to do it much better than many of the adults in the room so just making sure they know Here's what you need to do to speak publicly. Here's how you show up, at what time. You might have to have your driver's license. Like all these little details that we found in Greenville, people just didn't know. But once they knew, they showed up and the public comments have been very important in moving these local decisions to involve government. That's actually a good connect to this other question. What would be a key motivator that you would suggest to mobilize action from community leaders? What's the motivator to, to get action out of community leaders? We talked about this some. I think for us, it's been recognizing that you need to be the yes voice in the room. Like, if, if you've said what your vision is and, they, and your elected officials join you in that vision, which I can't imagine they wouldn't, they often don't have people showing up to say, yes, we can. And, and so usually what, what we see and you might see here in Branson is most people show up when they're angry about something. I think I hear some that's resonating in the room. <laughs> uh, so we have coined the phrase, which a lot of communities now are using the YIMBY mm -hmm. movement. Yes, in my backyard. Sometimes that applies to housing, but it can be a broader, like what is your community's vision? Yes, we want that in our backyard, and how do you make sure those people are showing up? And also contacting your local officials. So many people didn't even know who represented them. Like, I'm gonna say the young people, everyone in this room, if you don't exercise your right to vote every time it's possible, that might be the one takeaway. <laughs> make right. sure you vote. <laughs> Uh, then talk to those people, like just say, hey, I'd like to have coffee with you. And I think you'll find, as we have in Greenville, they're really happy when someone says, will you share with me what you see the challenges are for you as a local official? And, you know, are you willing to listen to what I see some of the challenges are? And then what can we find together that we can work on? Next question. Did you receive resistance or do you receive resistance to faith-based efforts and solutions to poverty? And how have you handled and navigated the balancing of faith response and governmental and other responses? I think you just have to find the right language for your audience. And so, like I was saying, when I speak now publicly in Greenville, I can't, unless I'm in a church environment, really lean into what's so natural to me, which is that language of why I do what I do and why, who I serve, why I get up every day. But you, you just got to find the right language. And, and so for us in Greenville, that's been being very transparent about what does it cost to live now in this community and what benefits aren't available to some jobs, which results in higher costs for our hospital systems or our law enforcement if there's no other option with you know, just helping people understand, like, what is it? We all need the same things around us to be 
healthy and productive in our lives, yet some jobs don't offer those opportunities. But maybe are, again, a good stepping point for someone returning from incarceration or who needs that first job, but you've got to make sure that ladder to move upwardly is there. So um, can you speak to the impact um, to the health of the community and how the project's increased access to health services and how individuals have been connected on the dimensions of health? That's a great, and I think, again, this goes to the power of the collaboration for Greenville. We had a partnership, so I don't know if your hospital system has a partnership, but there was a different set of partners that I wasn't engaged with at all, and they invited me to just come speak and share the housing trends and those school numbers that I showed you all. And once that group saw those numbers, it moved them to action. They had been meeting for almost five years just to really get to know each other, make sure they knew how to make referrals. And it was a very important type of collaboration. But when they saw that, they said, oh my God, it was like, uh, we call it, you, you, you get a new pair of glasses. <laughs> and when you see those numbers, you see your community in a way that you, you can't unsee it. <laughs> and so what, what we just had a meeting this week about was now our, all of our pediatricians in Greenville are gonna be screening additional questions around housing instability. And so if you think about how many visits a child from zero to five gets, that's a huge way we're opening up this change in environmental ways of looking at this issue and connecting people to resources. And then we also have on top of that um, something our hospital system is piloting called NowPAL. And that's, you can look that up, it's like an acronym. But it, it takes the services that exist in Branson and embeds them in your hospital system's um, data infrastructure. And then so as physicians make recommendations, that patient leaves not only with their health like prescription they might go get at the pharmacy, but they're also going to get the other community services that, are, that they need in addition, which in turn is going to save everyone dollars. Um. Uh, sort of a, a piece of that equation, you know, one of the challenges in the homelessness issues was all around mental health. And how have you sort of had those conversations and handled the challenges around mental health issues when it comes to poverty and homelessness? Well, mental health is, as you know, it, it's tough. Um, we, but we have a very small example in Greenville, and that's where being a data-driven coalition, we said, you know what, we've kind of got, again, another hidden resource here in Greenville that had been built about 10 years prior to the more formalizing of the Homeless Alliance. So the, some of the people who knew about how important this particular housing was in our community that involves a significant mental health component asked the first 13 residents to sign a waiver and they took that information to our Department of Revenue and Fiscal Affairs and actually pulled their medical rest records as well as their detention or um, crime record with their permission and we just said what was going on in their life two years prior when they didn't have the right wraparound support services and the right housing in their life and then once we house them it's called housing first we simply house them got them stable brought those voluntary resources to them what happened two years post and we took that and crunched the numbers and we said that is a 90 percent reduction in charges to our hospital system and to our law enforcement. 90% reduction in charges. And so we've used that example to try to educate people on it's both the right and the smart thing to do. So I'm gonna combine a couple questions. Keeps going. I've got almost 80 questions, y'all, so we aren't gonna get to all of them. <laughs> but you, know, you talked about sort of getting to a new number, which clearly meant sort of wrestling with some definitions and some counting, and one of the questions is, exactly how do you define homeless, right? It can be actually more harder than one might think. And sort of related to that, how then have you, um, how do you ensure the respect and honoring the value of those who are homeless in the process um, as you've navigated with folks and how have those played out for you? Yeah, so definitely look at our report and we feel like we've been able to the first, for the first time put on one page those different definitions and for us, it meant it's a very inclusive definition. If you lack a regular, fixed, or adequate nighttime residence, 
So regular, fixed, or adequate, which kind of comes down to, do you have your own key at the end of the day to open up your door? Um, then if you don't have that, then we consider you experiencing homelessness. So that's um, early in our report, and I would just encourage you to look at those, the way we've come to that definition, and it gets tied to funding streams that help you solve then the housing equation often. So that was the first part. Honor and respecting Honor. the individuals who are homeless and who are, you're working with and reaching yeah. out. So you're doing with, not for, or to. Right. So in, again, in our report, we were so pleased that we held listening sessions that invited and provided a way for us to listen and make sure the voices at the table were people who had the lived experience of homelessness. Um, the chair of our steering committee who runs Miracle Hill Ministries now himself experienced homelessness. And so making sure that those voices are heard and that will tell you a lot about what you're doing well and maybe where you could also improve. And, and I think what we saw in Greenville was when you do that and you create it in a way that's safe and respectful and inclusive, we had the, ch the Chamber of Commerce in the room as well. And, and there's just a, that's that power of education. Like, would he ever sit in that space in his day-to-day -day job listening to someone with the lived experience? But yet, and I left with Sue, our chamber has become an advocate at the local level in engaging our movement on transit and housing. And so that's when, in our system, our data system is, of course, protects um, the identity. So you got to make sure that whatever data system you all you're using, that you are respectful of protect, protecting the identity. And that's why I said on that study, we got signed releases for people to allow us to pull their information. So a lot of questions have come in about sort of the role of the schools, the education system, and how that's been sort of both a support and a barrier. And folks interested in hearing more about how have you navigated supporting students and families and what's the relationship with the schools and how has that played out? It's, it's an evolving relationship. So on our steering committee, that's our newest uh, person we've added and, and we're very excited about that because it, in that case, we know there, we need a lot more funding, but maybe with the kind of the top influencer of our school district being at our table, we can make some environmental changes meaning what is the information we could get into the schools with his help. Um, I would say having myself hired and having someone waking up thinking about this every day was the first time Greenville was able to, for the school system to trust releasing that data. And, and so there's been a process there and I would say we've had previous superintendents who might, I've been told, would not have released that data but I think, again, because we've been able to, to build that relationship, build our, um, build the community's knowledge about what it is we're trying to do as a homeless alliance, they released that data, and now we're looking at, there's another level of that data we need to understand, and so how can we, we don't just need to know the number, we need to know a bit more specifics. So we're headed towards a break. Um, I'm looking over your shoulder at Sue, who's going to look at her watch and look at me here in a second and tell me what time it is. Um, but I wanted to give you a chance to sort of, first of all, I want to thank you. I didn't at the beginning. Um, attention equals currency I'm going to steal and use everywhere because I think it was a great way of capturing sort of some of the importance of the work. But I wanted to give you a chance to finish with a question that's more about you personally um, that came in that I thought was a really helpful way to maybe let you wrap up, which is what made you realize that helping people who are in poverty or experiencing homeless, this work, what made you realize that this is your calling and that you wanted to be in this space? And why do you do it? Great question. Whoever asked that, thank you. Um, for me, I, I had a job, like you heard, I felt called to leave the private sector and move into a, a job of ministry with an amazing church. And I didn't say earlier that this church was so proud that it gave 40% of its annual budget out in mission. So I was so privileged to work in this space with a church that was extremely generous, both at the local level, the national level, and international level. And because of being in that space, I got to be the one often who would meet, at the local level, parents 
who were transitioning out of difficult situations. And so I realized there was just so much joy I found in seeing that transformation happen in a person's life. And, and once I, I took the call to ministry, when I had, when our, my husband and I had our daughter, and I thought, you know, if, gee, if that was me or my family and I didn't have this ability to, to move out of this difficult situation, how hopeless that would feel. And so then when I served on that committee with our city, I, it was just, there's so many God moments. And, and I think that for me, like that gets me up each day. But um, one of our church members who also had helped uh, start and run a nonprofit that builds rental housing took me on a, a little tour. And he said, you know, we'd stopped at one of the homes they had built. And he said, um, we've got a mom in this house. She has two kids. She works at Furman. That's our local university. And he said, I had to take a bit of a risk on her. Uh, she didn't quite have the income I needed for this house, but she's had really stable employment at Furman, and she works there in the janitorial services. She'd been there about almost 10 years at this point. And uh, he said, so I took a little risk on her, and I really needed to get like $550 a month for this home. But I said, you know what? I'm going to put her in this house, and I'm going to take less so I'm going to take a rent of about 525. So it wasn't that much less, but that made the numbers work for that mom. And it, so literally on that day that he showed me this house and I heard that story, we heard that now Greenville had a deficit of 2,500 homes in our city for the income range where this mom is working. And it and I thought um, if if we can't do more than you know, it, it was just if that called me to realize we've got to do more. I don't, I don't want to live in a community that's not making it possible for this mom to keep her house, to keep her, to raise her children, and to figure out how they can have a better life. And so that's what propelled me to leave this very comfortable position with my church and try this new thing called the Homeless Alliance. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. We are going to take a break for everybody, so let's say thank you again to Susan. We have a 15-minute break. There is water um, in the hall and restrooms out to the right. Um, we'll start back up at um, 1020. <laughs>